I'd like to read Psalm 133 first. We're also going to be singing Psalm 133 at the end uh, after the, the message today. It's a psalm about uh, a unity in the priesthood. A unity that the ironic priesthood could hope for and picture, but could never achieve. A, uni a unity typologically that points forward to another high priest, even our Lord Jesus Christ, who will indeed bind together all the people of God of all time under his sacrifice and intercession. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded his blessing, life forevermore. Turn with me now, if you would, for the text for today's message in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. The Apostle Paul is now moving out of what we call gospel indicative to gospel imperatives. Some have understood Paul's epistle to be divided between doctrine and application is another way it's been looked at. I like the indicative imperative paradigm. It tends to bring together and hold together the two phases of what Paul is doing. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we walk through this world relationally challenged. We often seem to be all elbows. And we turn to you now and ask you, Lord, to... Grant us by your grace to learn to walk anew, even to walk in accordance with the gospel that has called us and transmitting that love and finding its binding power, its, its Christ indwelling power, its Christ transforming power as we attend to thy word, as we so carefully attend to your body in how it relates. We commit now this time to you and ask for thy Holy Spirit to assist us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul has talked about the great plan of God that the triune God brings into the lives of his people from eternity past into the shed blood of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit as a down payment of the world to come. He then completes those reflections on God's great plan with a great prayer. Three components to that prayer in chapter 1. Chapter 2, we're introduced to the wonderful delight of being raised from our spiritual tombs by being joined to Jesus Christ in his resurrection, ascension, and even session at the right hand of God. What a new identity we have in the kingdom through our union with Christ. Paul then moves from the resurrection to the centerpiece of the cross in the life of the church where, where what we would consider groups of people that could never be joined together, Jew and Gentile, in the cross of Jesus Christ are, are 
joined together, reconciled to heaven and reconciled to each other to be a new man in Jesus Christ. And that new man, Paul goes on to say, is that new creation temple. Where people from all the nations of the world and all the diverse cultures and tongues come together as, as, and are joined together, brick and mortar, as the walls of that temple in which Jesus Christ powerfully dwells which we worship him, which we know him as we dwell with him and he with us in the new covenant temple in Christ. Then in chapter 3, we learned about Paul's ministry, a ministry of preaching and prayer uh, to carry on this temple construction uh, from the materials uh, of the four corners of the earth. And Paul finishes with a glorious, glorious prayer. Uh, in chapter 3, 14 through 21, a prayer that places us firmly in the foundation of the love of Christ, a prayer that, that expands that love in, in the life of the body as, as we see these dimensions used of height and depth and width and length because it's the temple of the Lord expanding outward and growing as the love of Christ is sounded out horizontally horizontally in the life of that temple until we come to the very fullness of God which we begin to experience in this world but we will experience as Paul says in its eschatological fullness when Christ comes back what a glorious picture of redemption Paul paints out chapters 1 through 3 now if you were the apostle Paul when you think about all the various aspects and components of Christian life, Christian living, Christian experience, you got done just mapping it all out, the gospel and the people of God that are called through the gospel, what would you say? What would be the first thing you'd say? Well, Paul doesn't leave us in suspense. Paul is concerned of the unity of God's people, that peace prevails on a horizontal level in the body of Christ. In other words, you see what Paul is doing, saying the body of Christ needs to look like the body of Christ. Who we are needs to start playing itself out in how we proceed. And so that is the central point. We find it in verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace, that Paul now wants to bring home to the hearts of the Ephesians and to us uh, as well. So he begins by doing a little tie-in with where he left off. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in, in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So in other words, you're a new creation, Paul is saying to us. You've been washed. You've been reconciled at the foot of the cross. You've been constituted a new creation and a temple that God worship, where, where God is worshipped by you and where you commune with him God dwelling with you, his people, in their midst. Now walk accordingly. If that's all true, Paul says, if that's the calling with which you've been called, walk worthy of it. When Paul speaks of this calling with which you've been called, it's not hard to identify what Paul's talking about. Just look at Romans 8.30. He whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Or in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says our calling was from all eternity according to God's grace. In other words, Paul's talking about what we have identified as effectual calling. That God through the gospel has laid hold of you and has called you by awakening you to the terms of the gospel and to, and to the value of what's being held out to you and the truth of what's being held out to you in Jesus Christ. So you will say yes, 
Yes, Lord Jesus, I need you. And you wind up coming freely and openly. But it's the Holy Spirit through the call of the Father that is ushering you out of darkness into his glorious light. As we read in chapter 2, it is by grace you are saved. Sovereign grace. As God raises you from your spiritual tomb of death, he calls you out of death into life. And so Paul says, now look. Walk according to it. Walk worthy of it. You are royalty, Paul is saying. You are a kingdom of priests in God's temple. Walk worthy of it. Walk in light of it. There's a great story of Alexander the Great. And after one of their many battles, as you know, Alexander the Great conquered the then known world. Very willful man, very his typical king with a will of iron. It was after one of their battles, one of his generals brought to him a young man. And he brought this young man to Alexander, and he said, Alexander, in the midst of this battle, this soldier turned and ran. Well, that was reason for death right there. Alexander was there to render judgment, and uh, Alexander said to the young man, said, young man, what is your name? He said, Alexander, sir. He said that Alexander shook with anger. He grabbed hold of the lapels of the young man and looked him eyeball to eyeball and shouted out, young man, change your name or change your life. Spared him that day. But you see what the point of Alexander was. <laughs> if you're going to have the name Alexander, then walk accordingly. <laughs> if you're going to have the name of Christian, then walk accordingly. Third commandment don't take the name of the Lord upon yourself in vain. Say, yes, I'm one of his, but I act like one of the devils. Walk worthy of the calling. It's a great calling. Walk worthy of it. The Apostle Paul tells us. And then again, I bring you back to this single thought. After you just got done saying to a people, walk worthy of that calling, what are you going to tell them it's going to look like? What's the first thing that's going to be on your mind that walking worthy of the calling is going to entail? And Paul says the first thing that's on his mind, of chief importance of walking worthy of the calling to which you've been called is to allow itself to play itself out in your relationships with each other as a body that seeks diligently the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. No. No. There are things in the body of Christ that threaten the peace of Christ, isn't there? Sometimes there's doctrinal or theological differences of opinion. And uh, all the sophomore theologians in your midst uh, are ripe fodder for creating divisions in the body of Christ. And I use that term very pointedly, sophomore means wise fool. You know enough to be dangerous. Not only is there the threat of doctrinal division in the life of the church, there's, there's difference of opinions on how to do things. Difference of opinion in politics. Some love Trump. Some hate Trump. Is that going to become a big issue in the life of the church? Where you line up on Trump and what he does and doesn't say and what happened last the last rally? There are going to be differences of race. Old, entrenched attitudes. Or sociology. 
or as it used to say when I was growing up, on the wrong side of the tracks. There can be differences of lifestyle. Differences in how you rear your children. I was trained by a seasoned church planter on an internship that I did in Denver. And uh, he said to me, you know what the number one thing is that, that tanks church plants, cause them to divide and runs them to the ground? I was, no, I don't know. He says, how you train your children. I said, wow. I was a single guy. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Fragile moments in close in a little church plant. This family does it differently from this family. And what do you got? Oh boy, you got the fuel for a lot of differences of opinion and how to proceed. There are relational frictions. There's downright sin. Gossip. Or whatever. That all threaten internally the unity of the church of Jesus Christ. And we all know, don't we? If not by personal experience, by the hearing or the ear of the horror stories of the body of Christ being damaged because the unity of the spirit and the bond of priests was broken beyond repair. The Apostle Paul gives here actions and attitudes that he calls us to pursue. First, the attitudes. The attitudes can be summed up simply, humility of the heart. These attitudes must prevail. Where these attitudes prevail, you have the, the grounds for pursuing the action. The attitudes are listed as four, but there are two groups of two. Verse two, with all humility and gentleness. That's the first grouping of two. And with patience, bearing with one another in love. That bearing with one another is often translated as forbearance. It's a little different from patience, and we'll see that in a moment. The first, the first group, uh, humility and gentleness, are people who are slow to give offense. What is humility? It's uh, often noted as lowliness of mind. It certainly does not mean some obsequious, you know, holding your head down, shuffling your feet. Oh, look how humble he is. That's not, that's not humility. Humility is that you are concerned about the interest and well-being and responses and benefits of others. That's humility. Humility is a self-forgetfulness because you're focusing your intention and your concerns on others. I'll never forget the little flick I saw with Brandon Frazier. He came back from another world, another age, and he had very good manners. And one of the guys asked him about his manners, why he responds the way he does. And he says, well, he says, my father taught me, which was like shocking to the guy. Your father? You got some, you learned something from your father? My father taught me that by having good manners, we show respect for other people and we help to make them feel comfortable when we're with them. And his comment was, well, I always thought you showed good manners so you could be better than the other person. No, humility is not concerned about me and my impressions or getting a step up because I know more or act better than you. Humility at its core holds its head up high to look around and notice the needs of others. And thus it's slow to give offense. Who's going to be offended by somebody who's obviously showing they are concerned for your welfare? Gentleness is the other 
attitude that is slow to give offense. Gentleness is a word that is translated as blessed are the meek. Some of your Bibles will translate that, gentle. In Galatians chapter 6, uh, if you see someone caught in a trespass, you are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. There's the word again, gentleness. You restore them in a way where they don't feel attacked. So the opposite of a gentle disposition is an attacking, judging, harsh manner. Paul says that these two attitudes of humility and gentleness give very little offense, if any. Certainly nothing legitimate. But then Paul brings in two other attitudes. Patience and forbearance. Those are the two attitudes that are slow to take offense. Patient person, you might say, is kind of a, a passive quality. Slow to react when something happens. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, he says, be patient when wronged. You know, don't just, just because you've been wronged and kind of burns, kind of irritates you. Doesn't mean you have to jump out there and re react. Be patient. Be patient when wrong. Slow, be slow to take offense. Forbearance is joined, just like humility and gentleness, they're very closely joined together. Uh, forbearance is very close to patience. It has the idea of enduring, putting up with, even though you're being annoyed or being pushed on, but you forbear, you continue, you persevere. It's used in other contexts, for example, being persecuted, Paul says, we bear it. Persecution keeps coming, we keep forbearing. We keep, we keep enduring. In 2 Thessalonians, it, Paul talked to the Thessalonians about the tribulations that they forbear. Tribulations were kept coming, but they were kept abiding, forbearing through those difficulties. So Paul speaks of these two groups of two, slow to give offense, humility and gentleness, slow to take offense, patience and forbearance. <coughs> now, Paul doesn't want us to somehow say, well, okay, uh, what you're calling me to is just the stiff upper lip, right? Is that what you're saying? This, you know, the old stiff upper lip. Uh, you know, no matter what happens, you just kind of take it and don't react and stoically push through. Is that what you're saying? And Paul doesn't let us conclude that way. That it's just all about being stoic and unfeeling. Not let nothing get to you. He says that those attitudes are to be expressed at the end of verse 2 in love. Love. Love is the underlying current out of which these attitudes emerge and show themselves. But yet, even though we may seek to walk in gentleness and humility, even though we may say, okay, I'm, I'll give this unusual person with their unusual expressions or their occasional abrupt word, even though I'll kind of give them some breathing room with that and forbear it, there are times when things exceed what we can forbear. There are times when all the humility and gentleness we bring to the table is still not able to subdue someone's heart that we mean them well, and a breach occurs. They do occur, don't they? Breaches. If you've been married for over six days, you know that breaches occur. Some occur on the honeymoon. Some occur during the preparations for the wedding. 
and some blissfully carry on for six months before the big blow-up happens. But anyway, if you're married, at some point in time, you know that the breach occurs. As much as you love your spouse and you want to be, you know, all you can be and do your best for the old Gipper and, you know, all these other pep talks you might give yourself in private, at the end of the day, you know, you can stand all you can stand and we've got to have a discussion. We got to talk. Or something was said at that dinner party that really was a put down from a person who should have been building you up and it stuck deep in your crawl. And you got to talk about it. And so Paul tells us that with these attitudes, though these attitudes of humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, are attitudes that create an atmosphere of peace in God's people, there are still times when we just need to be honest and say, you know, when you said such and such, when I didn't hear from you after six attempts, when you did this instead of that, that hurt. And we need to talk. Okay? It's okay. And Paul tells us that out of these attitudes, an action is to be taken. It's right there in verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I don't think eager is the best translation, by the way. I think the word diligent is a better translation that you'll find outside the ESV. I don't know, I guess he was in an upbeat moment when the translator chose eager. But really, diligent is the word. It means that you are applying yourself, carefully giving yourself with energy you're being diligent about maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That, that peace has been broken. Offense has been given. And there must be diligence exercise to restore, to pursue peace. Hebrews 12.14 says, pursue after peace with all men. Sometimes the word persecute is used. You can imagine persecuting somebody, how dogged persecution might be. Sometimes that's applied to the word peace. Pursue after peace. Persecute after. Say dog it on it to resolve it. It's kind of like this. If your house is on fire, someone comes knocking at your door diligently to let you know that the back of the house that is unoccupied in the moment is, is on fire. They're being diligent to address an issue that could what? That could burn down your whole house. And so too, when peace is left unreconciled, it becomes a fire that started, that can burn down a whole church. Or leave it fractured and hurt and wounded for years afterwards. Paul speaks, interestingly, that the unity of spirit that is pursued is something we must maintain. In other words, it's like an oil change in your car. If you don't regularly change the oil in your car, for example, you buy a new car off the lot, and you think, oh, how wonderful, my new car works, and you just forget about changing the oil, what will happen? Well, that oil will get contaminated over time. It'll take particulates into it. And rather than the points of close contact in that engine of smoothly operating together, the, the particulates in the oil will start grinding down the metal. And before you know it, that car will start leaking oil eventually. And then the oil will start dissipating out of that car and you'll be driving down the street one day, and what's going to happen? It's called seizure. It's seized up. <laughs> Everything got too hot and too broken down. Paul says the unity of the Spirit must be maintained. It must be regularly attended to, just like the changing of the oils in the car for the car's longevity and well-being. 
So when threat, when unity is threatened, Paul says actions should be taken. What actions should we take? What actions? Ken Sandy is the man who started a, uh, a company, I guess, or, or an association called Peacemakers, and he's written a book called The Peacemaker. It's a wonderful book. Uh, written by a Presbyterian Church in America man. I think, I think he's a lawyer, certainly write, writes with the uh, mind of one. But uh, he wrote a book called Peacemaker, and, and he says in that book that when, when conflict occurs or, or when an offense occurs, he says you're on a slippery slope. Imagine a slippery slope. And he says you can slide off one side of the slope in the midst of conflict uh, by attacking those who are involved in the conflict. He says the other side of the slope you can slip off of when there's an offense that's been given or a conflict that's emerging is uh, you can run away and avoid it and pretend there's nothing there. So in other words, here we are in the slippery slope of conflict, Ken Sandy says, and you can slide off either side of the slope, one by... uh, 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 peace breaking, attacking those who are involved in the conflict. Or the other is peace faking, just forgetting about it and not addressing anything. Or the correct response, Candy, uh, Sandy argues, is the biblical one, and that's peacemaking. Peacemaking. That is where you have that conflict. You don't slide off either side of peace breaking or peace faking, but you seek to resolve it biblically. In other words, to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Sandy then says there's three things that you can do when you have conflict. He says if it's a small issue, tiny issue, you can just simply forgive, overlook it, and forgive them. No action taken other than the action in your own heart and mind. Prayer to God. Say, I forgive you uh, in your heart. Don't let it get you down. Don't let it make you jaded or affect your outlook on that person. His benefit's a little bigger than that. And it's not something that would be right just simply to let go and you need to have a talk about it. Then you talk about it. You go to the people or the person from who the con- conflict you have with, and you say, hey, could we talk? Could we talk? And, of course, there's various ways to, to do that. But talking needs to happen for peacemaking, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, to be restored. And if you're really faced with a real whopper and a doozy of a conflict, which occasionally happens from time to time, Sandy says you better get help. Find someone that can help you navigate it so it doesn't go from bad to worse. Those are the three responses. Small, medium, large. But at the end of the day, peacemaking is the direction you head in, as the Apostle Paul calls us to here, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this is a reproduction, you might say, in, in a, on a certain level, Humanly speaking. For God the Father has had a conflict with us. Our conflict is that we're sinners that have broken his law and have violated his kingdom rule and we're traitors to who he is as his creatures made in his image. And God is the one who's taken the initiative now that the peace has been broken to bring about peace. He's taken the initiative. He sent his son into the world to establish peace. And on the basis of what Christ has done in dying on the cross and satisfying the just wrath of God, he sends out his ambassadors, his peacemakers, to declare to those at odds with God, you can be reconciled. You don't need to remain in this unreconciled state. God in love has done something to reconcile you to him. And now he's calling you to come and be reconciled. So that very gospel that has brought us to 
Christ. It has brought us to each other as it is fuels and models for us the very initiative of the Father. To take the initiative, as Paul said, to be diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. Now Sandy goes on to share one other thing that I think is really useful. This, by the way, this is about as how-to as my sermons are going to get. So if you, if you need more how-to than this, then I'm sorry. He says four things. Number one, when you're, when you're up on that slippery slope and conflict comes, and you know there's something that must be done, you must, number one, say, I, I want to glorify God in this. It hasn't come about by willy-nilly. God is not no longer sovereign because you have a conflict in your life, okay? <laughs> and thus, number one, we should be able to say, this is not an accident. This conflict is not an accident. It's an assignment from God. And thus, may I glorify God in it. May God get the glory in it. Number two. Move the log. This is from Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, that you see a log in your brother's eye, what should you do? Rather, you see a speck in your brother's eye. Jesus says what you need to do first is what? Get the log out of your own eye. Before you do anything, what do you do? What have I done to contribute to this conflict? We've got a conflict. What have I done to contribute to it? My wife is continually mad at me. What is she so mad about? She's just a cranky person. Well, maybe I'm doing something. Get the log out of your own eye, Sandy says. Matthew chapter 7, get the log out. And Jesus says, why do you get the log out first? Because then you can see clearly to help the person with the splinter in their eye. Then once you got the log out, number three, you extract the splinter. Because now you can see clearly to help the person with their splinter. Honey, I'm sorry that every week I told you I'd get the laundry started. And I haven't done it. And it's piling up. I see why you're irritated with me. Please forgive me. And what can I do to help you? Forgive me. Does that work? I think it does. And then lastly, be reconciled. Forgiveness asked for, forgiveness granted, reconciliation achieved. Number one, glorify God. Number two, move the log. Number three, extract the splinter. Number four, be reconciled. That's from Sandy the peacemaker. Very concrete steps, very biblical steps. When the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is threatened in the body of Christ. So how about you? How about me? Do we need to forgive someone? We kind of building up a little bit of a head of steam over something that really just needs to be overlooked. Or do we need to have a discussion with somebody in our life? We need to talk. We need to seek peace and pursue it. No matter what I do, that other person I work with seems to have a consistent negative attitude toward me. Maybe I need to go and seek peace. Get out the log. Remove the splinter. I'll never forget the time when I was a cook at the Ramadi Inn and my hometown in Fremont, Ohio, and I worked with this other cook, and I was trying to win him to Christ. And we'd argue and argue and argue all the time. And one time I offended him. I can't even remember what it is, but I know I made him mad. And I, and I thought about it, and I, and I was wrong. And I said, okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go ask his forgiveness. because I, I need to clear it up. So I went to him, and I said, Keith, you know, what I did was wrong, and I just... Would you please forgive me? And I got the most amazing response. Keith was not a Christian. 
He looked at me and he went like this. And I looked at him and I said, what's the matter? I don't know if he's trying to restart it hard or what, what happened, you know, <laughs> just knock him out or what? And he, and he says, the humility, the humility. Now, I've asked a lot of people's forgiveness because <laughs> I'm a big sinner, but I've never had a response like that. Praise God, Keith went on to get saved. Praise God, Keith's a pastor of Reformed Baptist Church in Owensboro, Kentucky today. <laughs> Amazing. You never know what's going to come out of uh, your repentance and sharing the gospel. But we, need, we always need to ask ourselves. We need to look and see how people are responding to us and, and say, is there a fence down that needs to be mended in my life? Then go. Go with the attitudes of humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance, and diligently seek to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Because that's what we have already in Christ. We already have it. We just need to seek to maintain it as those opportunities appear, as those assignments from the Lord, as those problems with work clothes appear. We need to diligently maintain the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. And why is that? Well, that's because verses 4, 5, and 6, seven times the number one occurs. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. May God grant us the grace here, individually and together as the body of Christ, to realize this is spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. And the devil will do what he can to divide and conquer. Let us respond in all humility by diligently maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Let us pray.